consumption is finally easing. Okay, now I was just having a, a chat with Rolf Gerber, my old friend there, about, you know, they're still pandering and they'll still have to pander because German elections, he reminded me, are still one year off. I wasn't quite sure exactly when federal elections are. Okay, and, you know, they're politicians. And of course, Merkel wants to be elected. But I do feel <coughs> that Merkel now feels a lot more comfortable that she's got her dodgy coalition under control, that she will sail through the elections, and that there's a bit more policy making clarity. And she has finally accepted what guys like me have been saying for a long time it's in Germany's interests. Okay? You don't, it's not you have to like these guys. We know the Greeks are lazy bastards, and you know they did all sorts of stupid stuff. And we also know they're never going to pay that money back. Okay, let's be very clear on that. They can't. Okay, you model. You don't have to do the model. We've done the model. You model full of tax receipts for the next century. They'll never pay it back. Duh. Right. Fifty percent haircut was a pre-runner to another twenty-five percent. Then there'll be another twenty-five percent. So for those of you who are working for various banks who hold this stuff, tough. Okay, you're not going to get it back. The important thing is she now recognizes you don't take your best customer, whether you like them or not, when they're on the ground and shoot them in the head. Okay? Because 60% of your exports are going to these people. You give them a helping hand because you want them to carry on buying Mercedes and Bosch fridges and all that stuff. Right? And she recognizes that. The domestic electric has finally been calm. Right? And she's basically said they're going to maintain the euro and euro. And I firmly believe that. And one thing that helped me really understand that they have finally got it right, whatever their austerity macro um, policies are, is Wolfgang Schaub was actually in town the other day. Uh, Bridget, as a good German, kindly invited me to go and hear the guy. And even though I, and, and, and I have, he was one of my three witches, if you remember. You know, I can't stand the guy in terms of his economic policy and his commitment to Hayek, right? He is, look, he's a smart guy. He is at least saying, we are going to keep the euro area intact. We now understand it's in Germany's interest. The euro will survive. And by the way, there won't be a Greek exit. Right? Because they finally realize it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It's a rounding area in the numbers. You might as well keep them stay. Because if you have them go out, it will cause far more dislocation on the market. Okay? And Draghi, thank God, Trichet, remember I said Trichet should be shot. Okay, and luckily they you know, wheeled the old man out, and they got somebody you know, with a brain in, and he's doing the right thing, and he's putting what you need, almost unlimited support. A central bank's job is to act as a backstop, unlimited support. The, the, it doesn't matter whether Mr. and Mrs. didn't say, oh, we can't be picking up these debts and, and, and having unlimited liability to the Spanish banking system. You know, the Fed in New York has unlimited liabilities every time California goes and blows up. All that stuff going on in California, the fact they can't pay their bills back for the next 15 years, it's backstop by the Fed. It's a union, whether you like it or not. Okay? So that is the good news. But the communication fog and the two steps forward, one step back, and the fact that there's 17 members, okay? Even though it, Berlin is the only one that counts, the 17 members, that will mean it's, it appears noisy for a long time, and you've just got to live out the noise, okay? Next year, you, every time it looks like, oh my god, it's sliding backwards, don't worry, it's just noise, only watch Merkel, only watch Draghi, and you'll be okay. Right? Now, the problem with the OMT, the Draghi saying, we will be like the Fed and give you unlimited support, being Europeans, the Fed just goes and buys bonds and supports the market, right? QE infinity. The ECB is European, and there's lots of Bundesbank guys on it, so you've got to fill in an application form with five pages, most probably in German. And so, so, you know, if you are the Spanish peer, right or over your dead body, do you want to go cap in hand to the ECB, it's basically going cap in hand to Berlin, the sponsor of it, and sign up to all this fiscal this and compact this and cut jobs here and tighten here to get your hand. No, you won't do that until you're absolutely happy. So you'll see some noise, it will go to the <coughs> brink of the cliff, and then eventually Spain, who've got their 100 billion for the bank, so don't worry about that. I looked at the Oliver Wyman numbers, the sound. I remember I used to be one of those guys, a, a, a bank consultant analyst, and Wyman of good, good people. 
So their 65 billion is correct, but they'll need another 100 billion or so for sovereign support. Okay. Um, now, to be fair, to be fair to Dr. No, okay, and to be fair to Charles, they do have huge domestic pressure. I mean, Mr. and Mrs. Smith on the street, right? You saw. Uh, built, which is, I think, quite a consistent, it's like the sun in England, right? But I have to say, some of the stuff they've been going, putting out in the press, saying they will not support these lazy bastard Greeks and Italians and Spanish, some of it's pretty good. I always thought these people didn't have a sense of humor, <laughs> but I am going to frame this one, right? <laughs> no wonder. Now, now you understand why there were riots when Merkel went to Athens. <laughs> But, but that is that is British standard. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who are German, please, you must have some friends somewhere who can get me a copy of this because I want I want one of those. Okay, Focus magazine, whatever it is. So, live and let die. Seventy nine. Yeah. Um, okay. This. this uh, Okay, we, we've got to start it. Okay. We, we, need, we need a prize, but I expect some of you, right, with my brother, come on, on it. You, 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 know all the, you know all the Connery ones. Yeah, it's my boss, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Live and let die. Right, so American political risk. Now, as you know, unashamedly, and so far I've called this right every time, I'm a great believer and a great fan of the American consumer and the American system. It works. Right? I wouldn't live there, okay? but they're fabulous on consumption. However, what has been screwing everything up, again, is not the fundamental economics. I'm not wrong on the economics. I'll show you the housing in a minute. Okay? What is an issue, again, is geopolitics, and it's not black swan. It's the end of bipartisanship in American politics. The Americans, once upon a time, believe it or not, if this is an oxymoron, were political gentlemen, if you could use that word in America. Okay? They were actually vaguely nice to each other. Okay? Bipartisanship has, has got so strained that it's something of the past. I mean, they did actually try to work together and get certain policy that was for the good of the nation through. They didn't shoot you know, Senate members in the head. Okay? Uh, of course, they didn't have the Tea Party then, and they didn't have people like Sarah Palin around. So you cannot bet, as financial analysts, uh, that the problem of the fiscal cliff and the fact that the Republicans will do anything to screw that guy, particularly if they lose, right? You can't bet that that's going to go away. So I can give you all the economics and say, don't worry, long term, medium term, back, you're fine. It's more than green shoots now, but it could still fall off the cliff, right? So. I, I, by the way, I can't watch horror movies myself, so, but I, I've seen some of the stuff on, on, on the web of the pictures, which looks fantastic, all gripping in blood and so on. And it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty young women being slashed, which is what's going to happen to your US equity portfolios on January the 1st. But it doesn't happen on January the 1st. What I put over here on this chart is S&P 500, as it was last year, when the Republicans again Force the Democrats right to the edge of a precipice and threaten America with default. Remember, they have a thing, debt is the only country in the world where government debt is mandated legally to a ceiling. And they were hitting the ceiling on the, the yellow dot is the 26th of August. I keep a lot of data in my head. 26th of August, they hit the ceiling. Okay? Now, count back from the 26th of August and imagine that's the 1st of January when they're going to hit this fiscal cliff thing. And the fiscal cliff is basically, when you hear this word, it's a, uh, a legal push where the tax um, discounts, the bush era tax discounts, expire. And if they don't vote to continue them on, 500 billion of taxes suddenly come in. Okay? So your tax bill suddenly goes up to the tune of effectively reducing GDP by about 2%. Even if you do nothing and just go to sleep and stay in bed, right? you suddenly get extra tax. And annual spending cuts forced by the Republicans in their austerity Hayek move, okay, take out another 100 billion to 150 billion. Okay, so you can, you can potentially on the 1st of January just take the U.S. economy, bang, 
just when it's doing nothing. Right? <coughs> Even that 3.8% of GDP number is their own congressional budget office. Not my number. It's not, not an <coughs> overly pessimistic number. Okay? And it will take unemployment, which is now nicely coming down, right back up again to 9%. <coughs> Right? So although I think the US market is a buy, I wouldn't be holding it on January the 1st, 2013. <coughs> and you can see that the noise, that the pushing people to the edge, comes out about a month and a half before. And a month and a half before would take us to mid-November. Right? So I would go short now, stay out of the market, right? This is what I'm going to do. Turn the news off, go on Christmas, stuff myself, have fun with my kids, watch lots of old Bond movies, okay, and then come back sometime middle of January, and it will have all been sorted out because they'll take it right to the edge, and then they'll do some backroom dealing and a compromise, right? But I wouldn't want to be in the market right now. That is assuming um, Obama wins, right? If Romney wins, it's actually going to be a big miss, okay? So that is all I have to say on geopolitics for the US. You know what to look out for, look out for it. Give me a call in January and we'll see how it's doing. Okay. Nothing to do with economics. Now, the Middle East, right? What to say about the Middle East, right? Who likes the Middle East? Yeah, this, this, this is, <laughs> I mean, this is another guy. There's certain people who just shouldn't be around on the planet. But, um, <coughs> but at least you can see, you can see um, his level of either drawing or intelligence or both, right? He's got up to the wily E. Coyote. Uh, for those of you again who have children and you have these guys, and, and he goes after the roadrunner with a bomb that always looks like that. Um, but this is actually the nastiest part of what's going on in the Middle East. You know, Syria is horrible, but it's less of a geopolitical threat and a black swan that could affect your investment portfolios than Iraq. Okay? Because, particularly if Romney wins, because you still have a residue of neocons hanging around, you've still got the Tea Party, you've still got Romney pandering to the, to the right faction, as we saw in the last cartoon, and it's people talking about dumb stuff, like invading, invading Iran, okay? Now, look, this, this guy has been stirring trouble for a year, trying to force <coughs> and push a, we're gonna go into Iran and do a preemptive strike prior to the US elections to force the issue. Luckily, Obama said no, brushed it off, ignored it, Hillary Clinton ignored it, and he failed to push the Americans. So he's finally climbed back from the gamesmanship of pushing them to the edge, and he's taken the line out to next summer. Okay? So what he did in drawing this bomb, he's basically saying, look, the red line is actually <clears throat> at the second stage. And he's finally accepted we're at the first stage. Okay? So what he's basically saying is he's climbed down. Israel is not going to fly and do a preemptive strike on Iran right now. Thank God. So we can all go for Christmas without that black swan and leave our portfolios where they are. Although, as I said, there's probably have to sell them for the fiscal cliff, right? <clears throat> but come next summer, just when you're through the US fiscal cliff, okay, you've got to deal with this, this idiot. Okay? Let's hope it doesn't go that far. Um, and this is what's going on in the rest of the place, right? Which isn't great, and at any point in time, stuff can flow up. Now, Syria is geopolitically important, and it does have an impact on what things go, if it gets out of control. Okay? Iran, of course, has a huge impact, because duh, if you invade Iran, they just shut the straits of Hormuz, and all our oil dries up, and oil prices all go through the roof, right? So if something as stupid as the last page does happen, just long oil. Okay. As, as much as you can before the price goes 250 and then cross your fingers and pray. But again, politics is now trumping economics on a lot of things. The Arab Spring, people didn't think that it would be the Muslim Brotherhood who would win, right? And Muslim fundamentalist turmoil in various parts of the world have not gone away. And that principal impact is through the oil market, which then comes back to all of us in, in oil prices, the market up. Follow so I won't say anything more on the bill, so, other than you always need to keep that in your rear view. The final bit of geopolitical thing I want to cover <coughs> is the South China Sea. OK? 
Okay? Now, I have long thought that the so-called peaceful, benign, we all love our neighbors, we don't have any axe to grind, you know, we forgive and forget, yeah, like hell, uh, Chinese thing would pop up at some point, particularly when there's oil involved, okay, and gas, and all sorts of other nice things under the South China Sea. So what this is all about, right, is basically bunches of islands that look like not much, right? Senkaku, the one that's causing the problem with the Japanese right now, is right at the top, okay? All of this stuff has what looks like very good um, geo systems underneath it, okay? And if you actually look at the profiling and talk to oil and gas guys, there's a lot of stuff there, there's a lot of gas, right? Um, what's interesting is, forgetting the Taiwanese, you see this being dark, face it, which the Chinese have in any way. The Philippines line is that little orange line that goes out from the Macclesfield Bank. Okay, that's what the Philippines are claiming. The blue line going around that side out of the thing of Vietnam, but cheekily from the Vietnamese all the way around across the coast of Borneo, is what the Vietnamese are claiming. And the Malaysians are being reasonable and just claiming the side outside Borneo, right? The red line. The dotted line that is right, that goes all the way from the top, all the way around the furthest line outside, all the way around the side of Vietnam, is what the Chinese are claiming. <laughs> it's all mine, right? Fuck off. Okay. Um, now, <laughs> this is a problem, okay? And there was a great, if, for those of you who have been saying for years to me, because I've been pulling this up for years, pictures of Chinese tanks and this on and so on, could China and Japan actually get, because China will never go to war with any of these ASEAN guys, right? They, they, they could just swap them like gnats, okay? But with Japan, that's a different question. And that even the economists were saying, look, could China and Japan seriously go to war over these things? Yes, they could. Sadly, stupidly, yes, they could. Again, nationalistic fervor once you stir up, which the Japanese and the Chinese politicians regularly use the political gambit, usually close to elections. Once you take that genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. I don't believe the Chinese leadership can put that genie back in very easily. Plus, they're having a very difficult once in 10 year leadership transition with one leader disappearing every so often. Plus, the economy is seriously slowing down for all the reasons I talked to you about. And if I'm right about the austerity measures and the current consensus, and I think fundamentally flawed economic thinking that's gone on the side of Hayek versus Keynes, if that persists, that's going to continue to depress Chinese growth and put more pressure on them to have some other sideline. You know, it's the oldest story in the book, when you've got uh, consumers at home feeling the pinch of growth not as high as it should be, let's have a little more, okay? And you've got the problem that the Japanese also have an election coming. Now, it's actually really very simple, okay? The Japanese have fundamentally a lot more to lose economically, a lot more. China now is their number one export destination, by far. The, the, the US and the Sony TV has broken down a long time ago. It's their biggest uh, foreign direct investment recipient by far, right? Their economic interests are huge. It helps support reducing, keeping inflation low and keeping consumers happy with cheap goods that they can't produce with very high labor cost basis back home. With cheap Chinese labor producing stuff they then sell in Japan. The Japanese go and buy Chinese clothes now, right? And they evidently have as many as 10 million Chinese on their payrolls, okay? So who has the most to lose? Okay. So these ge geopolitical risks are real, okay? Seriously, seriously real. Um, right, license to kill. It's, it's not our era, I know, I know. It's a horrible, um, who was in it? Timothy Dalton, that's why I don't know. A bad one, right? Okay. Yes, it's one of those, you know, it's those 90s ones that Timothy Dalton was. The girls were okay, but he was terrible. Um, so this is, this is how we stand at the moment. Now, um, given it's, you know, the 50th anniversary of Bond and we're British and we're wearing my British cufflinks and, uh, and I, you know, put my austerity uh, economics credential. I put the British fleet size up there. Okay. Is this on? Is that on there? Is that working? Okay. On, on or off? Off. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. 
doesn't rate, does it? <laughs> Romney was caught with a girl behind him, so. <laughs> but I think it was the same picture. Changing my battery. Then turn this off. Okay. Can you hear me with this? Yeah. While he's changing the battery. <laughs> Somebody should have a camera. <laughs> License to kill as long as the battery's alive. Um, You're talking about battleships. But as you can see, <laughs> Um, now, the American figure is not just the Pacific 7 fleet. Is it working? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, but you can see the extent of the Chinese build -up. I mean, where did those 65 submarines come from? Right. Of which a significant proportion are now nuclear and are armed with uh, nuclear missiles versus Japan. Okay. So this isn't the contest that it used to be. And they're not going to get any help, or very little help, from the Australians, who are their major Pacific, um, most important Pacific ally. Australian position is very much fully aligned with American policy and, and, and joining America and stuff like that. The British, uh, because of the austerity policies I mentioned, they do have, still have one aircraft carrier, but I hear there's no aircraft to put on it. <laughs> okay. So, so much for the great British, the world's greatest naval power. Okay. Um, look at India versus China. Look at ASEAN. So, I put in there, collective ASEAN. Notice I took Singapore out. Singapore is never going to help its ASEAN members. Okay. In a battle over South China Sea oil resources against claims from the Philippines and Malaysia. That's the kind of function ASEAN should do as a cooperative, collaborative entity, but they don't do that, right? It's a completely useless thing, not even economic cooperation, a little bit of free trade, they just sit and eat durians together. So, you're not going to get anything from there, but there's one funny thing in that data, right? Where the hell did ASEAN get an aircraft carrier from? How, how do they have that kind of projection of power, which the, you know, the Indians only have one, the Australians have zero, and soon the British will have zero. Right? And it turns out, Thailand have the world's smallest and foxiest aircraft. <laughs> Believe it or not, I mean, I was surprised, I had to double check the data, but they do have one. And it floats, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you come play with me. <laughs> this is, I, I shouldn't make, there's no time anymore. So. <laughs> oh my god, I forgot, my, my sister-in-law's half time. <laughs> I said, how do you say sorry? So, so there, is a, there is an aircraft carrier, but it's not going to do too much. So again, this stuff could erupt, and uh, it is one of those sort of so-called black swans. It's not really black, but quite gray that you do need to take into account. So that, that's the um, geopolitical situation. The Americans say they're not going to let this happen. Right there, by the way, boosting their seventh fleet as we speak. I have to say, one of the best single things from a foreign policy movement in the Obama administration is the shift in policy to the, uh, the Pacific and Asia. That's the best thing that I did. It took a bit of time to start getting a bit tougher with China and recognizing that this is a serious geopolitical threat, but it's finally happened. They wasted 10 years on the Middle East. The Chinese were laughing since 9-11. And they spent a trillion dollars and they invaded one country and then they invaded another country and got all this kind of nonsense. But meanwhile, the Chinese have been quietly building up and you know, they're finally awake. State Department are taking a prominent role and Hillary Clinton made it very clear that this is on their agenda. And quite frankly, we need the Americans to be here in the Pacific. And they can come and refuel in send by one and we'll all be very happy. The final thing on these um, not really tail risk events that I think all of you as investors, all of you, all of you as investment advisors have missed the impact on portfolios and portfolio performance. And, and I proved to you that equity markets is here nothing to do with fundamental economics, is monetary policy. Now, un unlike 
the geopolitical politics I've just been through and, and the economics of austerity, this sounds a little bit more, you know, economic, right? But it's very, very simple. We have never, ever had monetary policy like this of such awesome power. Okay? Uh, imagine having an unlimited balance sheet. I love that. Right? Imagine having the world's fiat currency. Okay? There is no other contender. The only one coming up, the euro, well, we've been through that. Okay? The renminbi is not yet you know, out there. Okay? It's still capital control. The yen, everyone gave up on a long time ago. So you've only got the dollar, whether you like it or not. And whatever you think about the underlying balance of the, of the US, you've only got the dollar. So if you can print as much of that as you can, and if you have a central banker who's actually prepared to use unlimited monetary easing, and to be fair to him, he's only doing it, because we all know it's a blunt tool, to make up for politicians' policy-making incompetence and fiscal austerity and fiscal strangulation. If you're not expanding money in fiscal spend, if you're not doing it on the fiscal side, which is better, go build bridges, railways, all that stuff, you have to do it on the monetary side. But we have a central banker who even Romney, other than when he comes in, I think he, when he comes in, he can't get rid of him until the end of his term in 2014, who is committed to independent and monetary expansion. And Draghi now, someone who's come in that's sensible, has replaced uh, Trichet and is doing the same thing. Do not fight against that. I still continually read stuff from analysts and economists on the you know, oh, this uh, is a blunt tool, and it's not going to work, and it's going to be inflation, and, and this kind of monetary expansion, and taking all this onto the central bank balance sheet, uh, just build sovereign debt in the long run, and it's all going to go pear-shaped, and we'll go back to 70s inflation. Nonsense, right? Every time they expand money and start buying more bonds, right? Is that working?
So Bernanke is taking the bet, and he has committed to saying, I'm going to keep this easy money cheap. Don't you guys mess around with me and think you're going to fight against that. Right up until 2015, and I'll do it for as long as it takes, and I'm going to buy 40 uh, billion of uh, mortgage-backed securities to prop the mortgage market up and force down mortgage rates. The second question is, is it working? And there's a lot of naysayers saying, oh, it doesn't really work. Bullshit. It's working. You're getting the highest level of US refinancing we've ever seen because they've got the lowest mortgage rates they've had since the 1950s. And it's working on everybody else. Little corporates like me sitting in Singapore, because we're tied to US policy every time the curve shifts down, we just did a round of refinancing at the end of a two-year cycle, right? Thank you, Bernanke. Thank you, Draghi. And we refinance the whole. Floating. Cyborg floating. Right? Because I know this is going to stay on there. Why would I go fix and give the banks an extra 50 bips? Right? At fantastic rates and fantastic margins. So there's a huge wave of refinance going on. US consumers are getting out of bed for this. It is working. Don't fight against it. If you guys think you can bet on inflation, and if you want to play the bond game, and if you want to not be in risk assets, because this is designed to force you to risk assets and equity, you are going to lose, in my view. Okay? So that is monetary policy and the importance of the extraordinary era of low rates. For those of you who don't believe me that this is unprecedented in history, I told you I am very fond of economic history. This is my hobby. I love reading up weird statistics from years and years ago. I showed you stuff before going back, you know, a couple of hundred years. So this time I thought I'd outdo myself and take it all the way back to 1694, right? July the 27th. What happened July the 27th? 1694, right? Bank of England was founded. Issued the first um, sovereign bill <coughs> bond, right? Uh, within a month or two after that, he got full subscription, uh, 1.5 million pounds. What was it for? Right? Absolutely, to get the French. <laughs> Quite right, too. In those days, they used to issue bonds for the right reason, right? Not <laughs> the National Health Service, but let's, let's go and invade. Um, unfortunately, they tried to take Brest, and, uh, which is a lovely little sort of well-defended fishing harbour, and, and it was a massacre. Right? So it's, it was sort of quite a famous year, because it was one of the few times the British Navy um, you know, failed miserably. Right? Now, of course, we know with one aircraft carrier, with no aircraft, uh, we can have repeats of these things. So this is real data from the Bank of England, long-run monetary policy, official rates, going all the way back to the foundation of the bank. 0.5% since March of that. You have never lived in an era of such easy money. Don't fight it, go with it. Okay? Senior debt, that's the place to go right now. And of course, risk assets, uh, not bonds. Diamonds are forever. So that's, that's, by the way, all I'm going to say on monetary policy, other than I had to finish with one taking the piss on rates, right? Which, of course, is, again, us British. Right, we know how to fix them. Right? Thumbs up for it. It's one of the early ones, I think it was 68. 